Well, good evening and welcome to each of you. Our first requested song will be 565. 565. is going to sing.
Thank you for that special. Number 19 is our next song together. 19. seven. Amen. 
96 will be our next song 396 if you're able we invite you to stand while we sing Jesus. 
this prayer. I'd like to ask Brother Rob Miller if he'll lead us, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for another opportunity to be gathered at your house tonight. Pray, Father, that our hearts and minds would be open and fully receptive to your word and allowing your Holy Spirit to come in and guide us unto the truth that you would have us to learn tonight. Please continue to be the special needs of your people and pray your mercy to be extended unto them. Help us as we go out into the world uh, each day of our lives to be striving to make a difference by giving of ourselves unto you so that you can work through us in reaching out unto others who do not know you or have you as their Lord and Savior. Please lead and direct our pastor tonight, empower him, and give him the words to speak that we need to hear. Forgive us each of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Jenny Carpenter ants in the pen and they're looking for another home. It's been a blessing to have Ken and Connor and Crystal with us for a few days and I asked him before the service if he had a word he wanted to say to us before they go back to Pennsylvania. So I just got a signal he does. So Ken, I'll let you come. Yeah, this, this morning's service, um, the Sunday school service, well, I think it was the morning service actually, but um, there was a verse that stuck out with me. I believe it was in Proverbs where it says, um, one soweth the seed and another watereth, but God giveth the increase. Um, this past year, uh, we had switched churches over in Pennsylvania. And if you wanted the story, the backstory behind that, I won't go into that now, but one of the hardest things with that was actually finding another church to go to. And something I found myself doing um, was wanting to compare it to previous churches. This church, you know, growing up in this church my whole life, 
I, you know, I would see a pastor and be like, oh, that's not the pastor I'm used to. That's not my dad. That's not who I've grown up with. That's not the style I've grown up with. You know, that's not um, what I'm used to. But as I started to pray and ask God to be, you know, to work within my heart, I, I was seeing that, that God was giving the increase. Even though the vessels that I, that I was seeing before me were not what I was used to, were not what I was familiar with, God was giving the increase. And I think one of the things that I've been seeing a lot recently, um, I was just talking to CJ about this the other day, but it's, it, today we're seeing a lot more ways to attack one another. We're seeing a lot more ways to find differences between one another. And this morning's message I, I found really refreshing to encourage us um, to that when we're spreading the word, not to be discouraged when we don't see that fruit immediately, when we don't see someone turning to God, when we don't see someone's heart um, reproved, or if we try to you know, show them um, how to walk closer with God, if we don't see that fruit bearing right away. And that's because that's what that verse says, is God gives the increase. You know, we're just that vessel for the Holy Spirit to work within us. And I, I think it's another part of that, very important part of that verse is, it says, one soweth the seed and another, another watereth. And so that's showing there a unity of brethren, a unity of um, honor, or serving and, and worshiping and glorifying our, our God together. And so that requires, you know, having a, having a bond with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think another thing that has, um, I'm, I'm just, this is mainly just me sharing, you know, my testimony recently, but also going into a new church, you're not familiar with everyone, you're not familiar with their events or, you know, what they do together to gather together in fellowship. And so there's a tendency to want to kind of back off and not get involved or not give your talents and, and glorify God. Um, but that's needed, that's necessary. I've seen it so many times where people have, when you share your testimony, when you open up, when you truly t tell what is going on in your life and in your heart, that motivates someone else. That motivates someone else to say, oh, I'm, I'm going through that too. You know, I'm, I'm really struggling with that. Can you, can you show me how you got over that? And I think that's, that's just something crucial that we really need more of today when we're gonna be combating these things where people want you to find your differences between your neighbor down the street or um, whoever you're voting for or whatever it is, that we need to stick to our values and, and stick to our unity under Christ. That's our main head. Um, and not to be following people of this world, um, but to be sticking to God and the one who gives the increase and to be trusting in him and to know that we have fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who have talents that maybe aren't ours, maybe they can water what we can't do. We, they can sow, we can sow, they can water. Uh, there's just there's just such a beauty to know that the Holy Spirit is working in each of us, but yet it's all working towards the same goal. So I wanted to offer that as a as an encouragement as well, on a, in addition to this morning's message. So if you don't mind, I also wanted to pray with you guys, just because it's a blessing to be here and wanted to uh, join together in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for tonight. I just thank you that um, we have a house that we can come to. We thank you that there are many hearts here that are just seeking you first in their lives. That there are people here who just want to set aside themselves, set aside their own desires, what they could be doing with their own time, and they just want to come and give glory and honor to you. You're the one that has given us all things, Lord, and you've given us way beyond what we deserve. Um, every time we fall short, every time we don't do what we're called to do, uh, you're still there for us. If we repent and turn our hearts over to you, you, you guarantee to be there for us, Lord. You're always faithful to your word, to your covenant, what you've prom promised to us, Lord. That's just something beyond anything that we can give back, but yet you still do it for us. You first showed your love to us by sending your son to die on the cross for us, and I just thank you for that love. Please, Lord, help us to have that love and share that love with others. Help us to be burdened for the lost, those that need you, not to give up when they, when they don't immediately turn to you, Lord, but to know that you are the one that gives the increase, to know that you are the one that turns hearts, you are the ones that opens up those heart doors, Lord. So please just uh, help us to be encouraged with one another. Help us to join together in fellowship and to be a bond that cannot be broken um, as long as we are trusting in and seeking you first. And I just thank you for all these hearts here tonight once again and bless in this service. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Ken. If you'd like to open your Bible to the book of Mark tonight, chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And we want to read a portion of this. It's an interesting story again, but one that we can glean a lot of good things from it as far as standing up against the devil. The devil is our enemy. And uh, he's your enemy. He's my enemy. 
and he works in ways that sometimes we're not aware of, but we certainly need to be much aware of him as much as we can. So in Mark chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, They came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were, they were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. There's an important point to be made here. All of this really happened. All of it really happened. Uh, sometimes we might think that things like this are not around us today. But you stop and think about the evil and the very, uh, I mean, things that shock you, that you hear people doing. Well, there's an origin. There's an origin of it. And uh, I think when you look at this fella, this man, there had been a time he had been a precious baby. There had been a time he was somebody's little boy. But we must not deny what evil spirits can do. And we know that evil spirits can definitely influence the life of an individual. Today it's called mentally ill. Uh, those who have some of these tremendous uh, characteristics about them and what they do, they say, well, it's mental illness and so on like that. But <clears throat> you have to look deeper than that. So the message for us is the devil hasn't quit. He's still out there, still working. He's here tonight. And he, he goes to church all the time. And uh, he's uh, trying to um, do what he can do. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4, it talks about that when Satan fell, he took a third of the stars of heaven with him. Now what that indicates <coughs> is about a third of the angels followed him. Now you can think about how many angels there are. And there are places in the Bible that refer to that, but there's a lot of evil spirits, a lot of them. So I'm not trying to give us nightmares, but what we are realizing is self-destructive behavior is everywhere. And people are doing things that, why do they do them? And uh, how terrible it might be. In the seventh verse, you notice the cry. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. 
So the idea is there are cries against God's righteousness. There are cries against God's judgment. But they are seldom identified for what they are. And that is being of the devil. You notice also in the 17th verse, they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. So the mood of society. We'd rather have our swine. We'd rather have our demon possessed, but we don't want Christ. The mood of society. Give us Barabbas. Crucify Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 4 tells us that Satan is the god of this world, and he blinds the mind. He blinds the mind to where that a person really doesn't see what they need to be seeing. Ephesians chapter 2 says he's the prince of the power of the air. And Ephesians chapter 6 tells us he controls the principalities and the powers of men. So we have a warning, 1 Peter 5, 8, to be sober, be vigilant. Because the adversary, our adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And don't ever get the idea because you're saved, you're safe. Um, <clears throat> there's been too many found out that's not the case. You have to watch and pray and you have to resist him with the word of God. That's the only way it can be done. So he wants to sift us as wheat, like he did Peter, take the good out of us and leave us weeping, and leave us with regrets. But we must not fail to recognize Satan's work in the lives of individuals. And otherwise, as we're saying, the devil can get the best of any of us. Those disciples, Peter, the others, they were the cream of the crop as far as servants of God were concerned. But the devil beat them at their game. And so we have to be careful because the devil can conquer our spirit. He can conquer the way we're thinking. He can conquer the way we're feeling. To where that we can, as they uh, did in the Garden of Eden, make serious mistakes. In the fifth chapter of Acts, we just want to look at a couple examples of what we're talking about. In Acts chapter 5, and there in verse 3, there had been a lot of good work that was coming forward in the fourth chapter of Acts because the church of Jerusalem had grown overnight by thousands. And that was uh, largely due to the fact on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 that God called in to the New Testament church Old Testament believers. You know, Acts chapter 2 is not a new plan of salvation, but it's God calling Old Testament saints who had come to worship for the Old Testament annual Sabbath of Pentecost, and God opened their eyes and called them into the New Testament church, and they were added on one day about 3,000. So you have them, they came from all other countries. They didn't live there in Jerusalem. You can imagine what would happen, I've said this a number of times, if 3,000 people was to join Faith Baptist Church in one day, and they were all from another state. So what would you do? Well, there were people that stepped up and there were people that had properties and they sold them and they brought it, brought the money in. And so there was a temporary plan to take care of the needs of these people. And so there was uh, Barnabas who was mentioned in chapter four and then Ananias. He decided he wanted to get a, uh, part of the acclaim of doing this great work and he sold a piece of ground he kept back part of the price but he pretended he was bringing it all in so he could get the glory of being such a generous soul but in the third verse of Acts chapter 5 Peter said Ananias why has Satan you see the devil got in the picture why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Now he influenced his wife. His wife did the same thing. She was in on it. And so both of them wound up dead. God took them both home prematurely. But they had passions. They had objectives. But the devil got into those. And so the devil can get into our passions. He can get into our objectives. 
and calls us to step over the line with the Lord. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, and there in verse 1, David being accredited as a faithful man, a man after God's own heart, yet it tells us in 1 Chronicles 21, 1, Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, the problem was the only way that Israel was to ever be numbered was God had ordained a plan that everybody was to bring a certain amount of money, a very small piece of money, put it into a box, and then the money would be counted, and that way they would know how many men that Israel had. So it spoke of redemption. God only identified his people through redemption. Well, David did it his way. And, of course, it got into a lot of trouble for David and for the nation. But the point I'm making up is, here is a man that uh, ordinarily would not do anything like this because his heart was uh, so disposed to do what God wanted him to do. But on this occasion, the devil made him headstrong. And you know what happens when you get headstrong? You will go up against what you even know is right at a point because you don't want to give in. So we have to realize self-determination is not the same as the leadership of the Holy Spirit. But the devil likes to push us in those directions. In the uh, 12th chapter of Revelation, in verse 9 and 10, it talks about how that the devil accuses God's people before God day and night. Did you know that your devil has already mentioned your name to God today? He accuses us to God day and night. So he wants us to uh, develop our own priorities instead of serve the Lord's will. But he also seeks to create alienation between us and God. And of course that leads to indifference, which leads to hardness of heart. So just how successful is the devil? We know how successful he is with promoting wickedness, corruption, and that which is antichrist. But one of the things I want to point out is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, here in the 13th through the 15th verse. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Christ said that we had to beware because many would come in his name, saying that, uh, preaching Christ, but they would be deceivers. Well, we live in a time and our world is full of professed Christianity. But false Christianity is one of the greatest examples of the work of the devil. And how many want to go on that? How many want to take that up? 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 says we have to try the spirits because there are many false prophets that are gone out into the world. And 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2 talks about that just as there were false prophets in the Old Testament, there will be false teachers in the New Testament, and they will uh, make merchandise of people. In other words, they're going to get a good, following, a good following. So Christ demonstrated the only way to be delivered from the devil's deceits is to hold to the fact of the authority of the word of God. When the devil tempted him in the fourth chapter of Matthew and other places, it says that every time he answered the devil with, it is written, it is written. And he didn't argue with him. He said, this is what the Bible says. So the devil's method was revealed in Eden, the Garden of Eden. And that is to get people to take some exception to God's word. Do your own thinking. You're intelligent, and do what you think will work out best for you. That's where the Satanists come from. 
I didn't know where the Satanist platform came from, but I read it in a newspaper, and it is this. The devil, Satan, was the first one to stand up to God and demand his rights. So they hold Satan high as a hero of civil rights. And they've got a pretty good following. So he's the first one to stand up to God. So the devil wants to neutralize every New Testament church. And the way he works to do this is to neutralize members one by one. And to wage a war against the spirit of God's people. To change our stand from standing with the sound doctrine of God's word under that which seems to fit better with the prevailing situation. And of course, when you think about what God says about religion in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3 and 4, that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So the idea is there is a better and more comfortable way than the way that the Bible reads. And 2 Corinthians 11.3 says that the devil beguiled Eve. Now that means that she made concessions where the word of God was concerned. And she had heard, she knew what the Bible said, but she made concessions. She was beguiled. So to be beguiled is to let the devil convince us God's way is too strict, God's way is too hard, and God's way stands in the way of what we can achieve our own way. And of course, you oftentimes will hear the statement, well, that church is too strict. Well, that's what it's all about. So it's thinking that making concessions where the laws of God and judgments are concerned that is to be more gracious, to be more loving, to be more, you know, able to relate to people. But here's something to think about. It's not just people. We're dealing with the devil. And our warfare is not with people. Our warfare is with the devil. And so Satan will never be defeated by what I think. Satan will only be defeated by standing for the word of God. It's the only way we can defeat him. Otherwise, he's a power greater than we are. So I have a couple quotes that I wrote these down many years ago. And it first one is, it is better to be divided by truth than united in error. And it's referenced Psalm 127.1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Then another one is, it is better to speak the truth that hurts because it's a way for healing than it is to speak lies that comfort but then lead to destruction. So in the realm of spiritual things, there's only one power that can give us the victory, and that's the power of God's word. I'm not big enough for the devil. You are not either. And so we have to have the word of God as our means to resist him. So I want to just point out some concessions that Satan is pushing. The first one is conceding Christianity to religion. That's been done a long time ago in our country. And our society has come to the point where it considers whether you're a Muslim or whether you say you're a Christian or whether you're a Hindu, they're all the same. Conceding True Christianity to religion. That's one of those that have been adopted universally. Also, our society has entered a post-Christian era. And that is, we've come to the point where we say we've got to exclude the Bible. We've got to exclude prayer. We've got to exclude the name of Christ because it might be offensive to somebody. So we're in the post-Christian era now. We're beyond we have conceded to heathenism. But the, uh, the concession of truth to error, where did it first happen? It first happened in those churches that were supposed to stand for the truth. Because truth existed before error did. So when one compromise is made, 
Then another one is made. And the first thing you know, the idea comes in that sound doctrine will do more harm than good. And so therefore, we've got to concede it. Then another one is the conceding of righteousness to man's definition of goodness. In Matthew chapter 7, Christ uh, dealt with this one. In Matthew chapter 7, and how many people are on this train? But there in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, in thy name have cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Ministries are accepted not for what they preach, but rather for what they offer. What they offer that is considered good. All oh, preacher, they do so much good. They do so much good. But you know, Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. A church will do, it's like the old saying, if you give a man a fish, he'll have a meal, but if you teach him how to fish, he can sustain himself. So if religion is just giving away fish, they're not really getting to the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem is, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So when a person is saved, right with God, serving God, God will be with them, and God will make a way. And like the psalmist said, I've been young, I'm now old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. So rather than teach people to walk by faith, to live by faith, to overcome by faith, the idea is to set up a faith-based charity and do so much good in our community. Then the conceding of absolute truth to relative situation ethics. The idea, well, we can't look to the way things were done in the Bible because that's not our world. But what's being missed in that is the God of the Bible is still the God today. And the changes that have taken place are not the right changes. We need to be able to go back to the God of the Bible. So churches will transform themselves under what fits with the world and what pleases men while maintaining a form of godliness that as 2 Timothy, the third chapter says, denies the authority thereof, denies the power of God's word. So not staying with the book, but with the ever-evolving memos of the latest successful methods of drawing a crowd. <coughs> Boy, is that a big one today. Uh, the many things that will draw the crowd. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, I think these are some of the most important verses. If anybody wants to know what is New Testament doctrine, what is correct, how should we establish and structure our doctrine, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture, that's Old Testament and New Testament, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for our doctrine, all of it, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So what is proper New Testament doctrine? It is based on the principles that, that are taught in the Old Testament. The same God. And if God was to change, then he would not be true to himself because he said he has never changed. So... Then this thing has come around in my lifetime, and it really caught on like wildfire. Well, we're not under the law. And you know what it means? We don't have to worry about the examples, the principles that are in the Old Testament, because we're under grace. We're not under the law. Well, if you don't take all Scripture, if you don't observe the principles as they're taught through all Scripture, 
you don't have true New Testament doctrine. You don't have true New Testament doctrine. At that point in time, it just goes back to what happened in the, in the book of Judges. Every man doing what is right in his own eyes. And that's not true doctrine. And, of course, God has a lot to say on doctrine. But the, the Bible, just keep this in mind. 1 John 3, 4 says that sin is the transgression of the law. So the law of God is how we find the right principles. And even though we don't observe the practices of the Old Testament, which were typologies of Christ to come, and they all conveyed a principle, we don't observe the types, the principle is still true. God never set forth a false principle in the Old Testament. And he never did put, like the Bible says, his commandments are not grievous. That is, they're not excessive. They're not unnecessary. And so we must be careful that we do not change the character of what it is to know God. And it all comes from all scripture. And that's why we have to go back and study all the scripture and not just uh, say, well, we're not under the law. It doesn't apply to us. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So whatever is, is, is excluded from the word is excluded from faith. And so you can narrow it down to where there's practically nothing left. Uh, just a matter. And so we're talking about the conceding of the truth of God's word to relative ethics. And that is whatever a person thinks. And then a, another one. The conceding of morality to amorality. Amorality is no longer concerning ourselves with God's moral standards. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we have the Holy Spirit writing to the church at Corinth. It says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you, from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Again, the devil likes to capture our spirit and get us of the wrong mind and the wrong frame of mind. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, for ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So there's hardly any stand uh, in our day and time against immorality. Um, people are more concerned about the feelings of the sinner than they are concerned about the feelings or the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that's wrong. We ought to be first concerned about how things are with God than how that a person might feel. That's how Eli brought the judgment of God upon his house. Because you recall back in 1 Samuel, the second chapter, Eli's sons were priests. They were committing fornication right at the very house of God. And uh, God had told Eli that to take his stand. He wouldn't do it. He just said, well, you're not doing the right thing you ought to do. You're doing wrong. But he wouldn't remove him from the priesthood. And so as a result, why God judged his whole house. So due to concessions that are made in people's minds, the idea that sin is inevitable. I, I know uh, I read a little bit about a Catholic manual one time, and they just call it human experience. Sin is inevitable. In other words, you just got to go with it. You just have to go with it. And it's just the way things are. So you have to go with it. And we're going to have to accept the transgression of God's laws. we just got to work with that. It's got to be something that's inevitable. It's something that we're just going to have to work with. 
And so the more Christian thing is to show love and goodwill toward the transgressor and be the good guy. Be the good guy. Don't look at sin through the eyes of God's word, but make allowances for it based on your familiarity with it. Now, Christian people, many times in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it talks about, Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, and it lists a list of things. Such were some of you, but you're washed, you're cleansed. So if you've got a past, let it be the past. And commit it to God. You make things right with God and move on. But because we have, a, have something in our life, or we know somebody, I'm like, oh, I know that person, they're a good person. We still must see sin through the eyes of God's word. We cannot see it through the eye. Oh, I'm familiar with that. I'm familiar with that person. And I'll tell you why. God is not making any concessions on his laws. He's not doing it. When we break one of the laws of God, we've got to repent. We've got to make it right with him. He's not going to change for us. We have to repent and make things right with him. God is going to judge everything by his word. Saved or lost, it makes no difference. And like we had in our Sunday school lesson this morning, it didn't matter whether they were just of the seed of Jacob or whether they were of the spiritual side of Israel, the same message to the same people. And sometimes we just take the, oh, well, you know, they're not saved, so. And we become so familiar with sin that we no longer see it through the eyes of God's word. God only looks through the eyes of his word. And he is merciful, not willing that people perish, but that they repent, not accepting us as we are, but through repentance and faith and cleansing by the blood of Jesus Christ, why then things are established on the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God is not going to concede any of his word. It doesn't matter how that uh, you and I might frame it. I know there are uh, talking points and people can frame anything in a wrong light. They can present anything that's wrong and yet make it look or sound good. And God's not gonna change because of that. He's gonna judge the world in righteousness. And so, we must not get to the point where we're so familiar with things and so familiar with people who are doing wrong things to where we start conceding God's righteousness to sin. We must not do that, but rather we must answer the call, who is on the Lord's side? You know, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is one of the things that makes a New Testament church unpopular. But in 2 Corinthians chapter, excuse me, chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So things that are wrong are wrong. And God says that a church has to view them that way. And we cannot let pride prevail. We cannot let certain personalities prevail. We have to deal with things for what they are. And a church has to do that. If a church doesn't do that, then those things will get the upper hand. And you know how they get the upper hand? In the spirit of man. Man begins to think, well, I know that person. They've, they're pretty nice to me. And the first thing you know, then the sympathies begin to shift. And the first thing you know, the spirits of people are going in the wrong direction. A church has to present things for what they are. Otherwise, those things will get the upper hand. So we must not make concessions with things that are wrong. 
In Luke 18 and verse 8, Christ asked the question, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? And that's a question we have to answer as a church. When Christ comes, are we going to be faithful to him? Is that what he's going to say? Or will we have strung ourselves out so far that we would not be credited as being faithful? Joshua chapter 1 and verse 7 only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So we must remember Christianity is about Christ. It is not about <clears throat> us doing what we think is the better thing. It is about following him. May we bow our heads for prayer. Father, we just pray that you'll bless your word tonight because we know that the battle is not over. We know the devil is not quit. And we know that in our own strength, we're no match for him. And he's able to blind our mind the same as he has others. He's able to get us to say, I would never deny the Lord and yet do it before the rooster crows the next morning. So we know that when it comes to the devil, the only way to resist him is to take our stand with the word of God. And we're thankful you've given us that word. If Eve and Adam would have taken their stand on the word of God in the Garden of Eden, things would have been totally different, but they did not. So we pray that we'll always realize what happens when we don't take our stand on the word of God. Bless the invitation. Bless your people with the hearing of your word. And we pray that we'll want to be soldiers of Christ and we'll want to have the true eyesight that your word can give us because we know that you're dedicated to our salvation. You're dedicated to our victory over sin. But we have to be dedicated to you for that to, to occur. So thank you again in Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand while we